Okay, cool. Uh, now our final uh, speaker before our break, uh, we have Remy joining us, I believe. Remy and uh, and Adrian will be joining the stage now. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey there. Coming from uh, Faber Novell. Uh, great talk setting the stage uh, for us this morning with Cyril. Um, who's been a speaker at API Days every year. I look forward to hearing him every year do his keynote, so <laughs> I didn't disappoint again this year. Um, do you, who's, which of you is going to be sharing your your presentation deck, or is it a discussion? Uh, I, I, I will. Yeah, exactly. Great. No, I, to... I, I, I will. All right, Adrian, put on. Okay. Um, oh, Remy's pointing up. <laughs> yeah, uh, because Adrien is, is, is coming uh, this way for me on my screen. <laughs> Very clever. Okay. Adrian, do you want to uh, put your slide deck up and we'll make sure that that's working? Yeah, can you, can you see it? I mean, can you We did show it? Set? Yeah, oh, perfect. here it is now. Yeah. Right. Good. Great. Wonderful. Okay, I'll jump off and leave you to it. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, so um, in fact today, uh, what I wanted to talk about is, I mean, can be uh, applicable to APIs, but it can be honestly uh, the same for all the cloud services that you may be using uh, every day. Uh, we are always taught that you should not put all your eggs in one basket to avoid the risk of losing everything at, on at once, basically. Um, you can apply it to many verticals can be skills, investments, income sources. You can apply it in your private life, um, in your professional life. Um, and you always have to diversify yourself. Uh, the question behind it is, should we also apply the rule and diversify when it comes to cloud providers, cloud services, and APIs? And this is something we wanted to uh, dig into today. So first of all, quick. Uh, very quick introduction. So I'm Adrian, working at Faber Novel, uh, which is a um, consulting firm uh, on on tech um, tech uh, um, subjects uh, such as cloud and DevOps, for example, uh, on which I'm head of inside Faber Novel. And I will let Remy uh, introduce himself. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Remy Leon. I'm working at Scaleway, which is a French cloud service provider. And I'm working as an engineering manager for the developer tools team. And I'm also giving a lot of courses internally to present what is the cloud and to explain in simple terms uh, a lot of very complicated technological uh, concepts. So yeah, mostly working on the developer tools and working a lot with APIs. And so today, what we wanted, in fact, it's to have the, uh, I mean, my vision completed with uh, the vision of a cloud provider uh, here, Scaleway. And thanks to Remy, I hope we'll have uh, some uh, some uh, insights to share to share to you. So the, the um, uh, main um, issue we see is that uh, there is a clear fear of vendor locking when we are talking about cloud services. Uh, most of our clients are not confident in going into one single cloud provider because they feel that they will be locked to uh, those services. Uh, so they are trying to think about multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, uh, using some services that maybe are easiest to uh, replicate on another cloud provider. But is it always the best solution? Uh, is it the only solution that they have to put in place uh, to, to protect themselves? Uh, this is something that we want to uh, share, uh, hold together uh, today, and to see if this fear is very uh, and still justified and inevitable, or if finally uh, we cannot just minimize its impact uh, by taking some, some uh, intelligent choices, uh, by putting in place some uh, some um, some simplest uh, enablers. Just to, to go back on, on the cloud itself, uh, I think what it's important it's to see that it's still growing. Uh, we have a landscape of actors working on YAS, uh, PaaS, SaaS services uh, that are, I mean, created every day. So IT cloud has 
become a complex ecosystem of technologies, products, and services. And this, I mean, has created a multi-billion dollar economy with many cloud services providers competing uh, each, uh, each another um, to increase their, uh, their share on, on the service market. But of course, this has created also a certain complexity as we are viewing more and more uh, actors, uh, such as what you can see on, on the picture, where we have more than a thousand cards representing uh, uh, those so many actors. Uh, so here you will find Scaleway, you will find AWS, uh, which are the main cloud providers, but you will find also smaller actors providing some sp very specific services, such as Kong, APG, and so on, uh, such services uh, around APIs, for example. So the market is, um, I mean, given the past financial results, it's an evidence that um, the enterprise appetite, appetite uh, for the cloud computing is uh, increasing, of course. And the obvious, obvious, obvious question, sorry, is how tall will it go? How tall will it grow? Uh, because many people over the past few years, few years uh, have predicted slowing growth for cloud market share and it's clearly not what we are seeing currently um, due for example to the to some factors huh, such as the covid crisis that we we had uh, we have seen an accelerating of the digit digit digitization process uh, sorry at least on on the on the last decade and i think now um, the growth rate will uh, increase uh, because the the enterprise are more clear on the benefits that the cloud computing can bring them, um, and so I think we are just at the let's say the beginning of it. Oh, sorry, I've moved too fast. Um, I, I wanted to do a quick focus on what is the French and European ecosystem around cloud. Uh, basically, when we are talking in France of OVH or Scaleway, it's not uh, new uh, new companies. Uh, they are here since uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, so basically, they are quite well anchored into the French ecosystem. Uh, we have seen also many uh, initiatives in order to have uh, um, a European cloud, or at least some initiatives that are, I would say, uh, a little bit against what we can see in uh, in America, in Asia, uh, but without the support of the French uh, ecosystem, the French companies, the European companies, uh, the um, I mean the um, the fight between the the, the biggest uh, cloud providers, for example, such as AWS, Azure, GCP, is hard, and that's why we see that such initiatives such as CloudWatt and Numergy has um, disappeared uh, because they were not able to uh, to impact uh, enough the, the market. So it's also a, a common uh, responsibility uh, to build that French and European um, um, ecosystem uh, and to make it uh, to, to make it um, um, to, to make it uh, stable, I would say, or even to uh, to have it accelerating over the next years. So now that we have just done this quick focus on uh, cloud, I wanted to uh, go deeper into diversification and solutions that we could bring uh, to have the best strategy and the best way to avoid that vendor lock-in when we are talking about APIs, when we are talking about uh, cloud services. Uh, the migration of applications, workload, and data to the public cloud is a process that should not, uh, and I think is not, maybe you are not agree with that, but is not undertaken lightly. Uh, the aim when you are going to, to the cloud is to stabilize workloads uh, once they and their data are finally on cloud services. Because we all know that moving workloads from one cloud to another one is quite complex and it's risky. Uh, so the first step to be undertaken is to stabilize it. Uh, but of course, the cost of lock-in with a cloud provider is also high and must be weighted up. 
uh, it's, a, it's always a kind of balance that you have to uh, think of and um, that uh, that uh, lock-in uh, issue uh, goes against the agility that you want your IT organization to have. Uh, so it's of course well known that not all cloud providers are the same and have their strengths and weakness. So ideally, cloud providers should be chosen at the workload level to define the service that best meets the need and not uh, be chosen for other reasons that are not, uh, um, I mean, that will not go in line with uh, the, um, the best service for your, your workload needs. Uh, so the fear, I mean, we have many fears around vendor locking and we have many fears around going to one particular cloud provider, but basically the one, and if we want to summarize them, it's the lose of control. I don't know, Remy, if, uh, if you have seen some, uh, uh, some specific fears about clients asking you uh, yes, most most of the fears that uh, we have gathered are uh, concerning the cost. So um, it's uh, quite easy for a startup to start with a given cloud provider. You get a lot of free credits and you can bump from cloud provider to cloud provider. So it's quite easy at the beginning, but at one time the credit run off and uh, you are left with uh, services that are dependent on a given uh, managed service. And this managed service, most of the time, uh, have costs that expands much more quickly than your sales. Uh, so it's usually a concern about cost. It's usually a concern about what to do in case of a merger. So in case your startup is bought by a, a company that is bigger than you and using a different cloud provider than your own, then uh, you are left with uh, when the negotiation for the for the buyout uh, happened. Well, you're kind of left with uh, how much time will it take us to migrate your infrastructure to ours? How much time will it take to migrate your stuff from our infrastructure? And uh, those can delay uh, productivity, can delay developer work, and can delay a lot of stuff. So yeah, it's mostly about cost and what to do in case of a merger with another company. And so that those, those fears are justified or are not? And it, it's, it's the question behind it, because uh, if we are just talking about availability, for example, more than half of the organizations believe that data backed up to the public cloud is safer than data backed up on premises. Uh, but, and it's, it's, I think, an important other metric, nearly half of the organization believe that it is the responsibility of the cloud provider to recover the data and applications in case and in the event of an attack or loss of a, of a specific uh, a workload which is of course not always the case, meaning that it will clearly depend on the service you will consume. Uh, we have some uh, specific example, for example, in uh, 2017, when uh, the, the uh, S3 uh, AWS service went down, uh, you were no longer able to write on, the, on an S3 bucket, uh, and uh, it, takes, um, it took uh, AWS 11 or so hours to recover the service. So we can see that even for AWS, uh, and even if you are on a service that uh, offer you a high and very high availability, you always have um, a possibility to uh, lose access to your service. And so uh, you always have the possibility to not provide the service you should to your consumers. So you need to think about it. Another example could be, for example, and I've seen it uh, at, a, at a client, uh, to be to have your account, which could be on AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, whatever, but could, could have your account act uh, and no longer able to connect to it. So you will lose all your workload. Maybe someone will also uh, pop up a lot of VMs and you will see your, uh, your credit card burning. Uh, and of course, you say, okay, I have my account blocked. I cannot access to my account. So what I will do, I will just restore my, my backup, my data. But if your backup is also on that specific cloud provider, in fact, you can do nothing. So 
it's also the importance of thinking about multi-cloud when you are uh, when you have a sensitive workloads and you want to maintain it even if uh, you lose access or the specific service of a, of a cloud provider is down so that you can um, recover from it. So do we have solutions? Yes, we have solutions. Uh, we have, for example, the containers. Uh, it's maybe not so easy to read it uh, from the slide, but those are containers. Uh, you have some benefits behind containers. You have the portability of information. Um, the major benefit of using containers is uh, that you will create some isolated environment, uh, allowing you to move a container from a location to another one, to move your application, or at least part of it, from a location to another one. Um, this will help mitigate the worry of supplier locking for many, giving you the, the option to switch cloud providers without having to worry about losing all the work done to build and migrate uh, the uh, IT infrastructure. Um, so the only activity that you will have to do thanks to containers when you will want to switch, it's in fact to switch the container, but not to rework or reconfigure the application itself. So it will be, of course, a gain of effort and energy when you will want to, to do that switch. Uh, another benefit is that you will encourage microservices architectures because you will completely uh, uh, break down your application into small parts, small pieces. And this will, I will say, enable agility inside your organization uh, as you will no longer work on individual pieces and big monolithic blocks, but uh, you will um, you will have to map your organization to that uh, specific mindset of building microservices, application microservices, functionalities, and so on. But of course, uh, I mean, it's not uh, all shiny, shiny, and uh, you don't have only benefits around container. You also have, um, I would say, uh, um, difficulties sometimes because security is not quite well understood yet uh, on containers. You have to handle the elasticity of the infra. Uh, you may think that if you build containers on premises, you need to build it as it is for a cloud provider. You need to think that your on-premise on -premise IT should be as, uh, as a, a public cloud uh, infrastructure with the same services for your businesses, with the same scalability, with the same uh, networking. And this could be done thanks to uh, well-known and documented APIs, for example, that will really support uh, the, the way you will structure your, your, own, um, um, your own IT, uh, IT infrastructure. A another one could be also automation. Uh, for example, when I talk about Terraform, which is the tool to uh, automate the provisioning on, on the cloud services, uh, which will allow you, in fact, to automate deployments uh, on AWS, Azure, uh, AWS, uh, GCP, sorry, and, and other ones. Uh, you will take benefits of the APIs provided by those cloud providers with that uh, specific tool. Uh, of course, you will have a up cost at the beginning, but this is something you will be able to value when you will think of adapting it to another platform, another uh, set of services uh, later on when you will want to move your workload. So this is, I think, uh, an up cost to think of and uh, an, an interesting one. And when you have competency on Terraform, let, let's say uh, if I take that solution, uh, you have done more than half of the way uh, to build uh, um, a, an automated tool to allow you to, uh, to address all the cloud services. But of course, it's not a, a, a my recall. I mean, uh, doing some automation with Terraform uh, will not delete all the complexity that you will have between 
the cloud providers when you create a VM on AWS, it's not the, the same than creating a VM on, a, on Azure, which is not, again, the same than creating a VM on GCP because the storage is not under the same way, the network is not under the same way, and so on. So you, you always have to think about it. I don't know, uh, Remy, if you have other um, uh, solution in mind behind automation and what you recommend on, uh, on it. Um Automation is actually fine and Terraform is actually helpful for several reasons. The first one is that you get the same language to talk about different providers and this is absolutely helpful. And it's one of the most multi-cloud ready solutions that we have today. Uh, an alternative to that could be to have a layer of abstraction, but the problem with layer of abstraction that promise you to have one single API that work across all vendors is that usually you are reduced to the lowest common denominator and you don't want to be this person that uh, is skipping the most advanced feature and the most helpful features just to have something that is working across the board. So usually what you want is to have the same language to describe everything. So Terraform is usually helpful for that. And two, you want to build on top of standard and uh, on top of platforms that are... Uh, that can find that and can have substitute and that is a perfect and uh pass to you adrian for the next slides yeah i mean i will just speed up a little bit because i'm mm -hmm. running the time but yes of course i mean you can clearly uh, rely on open source on standard uh i mean thanks to open source and standards you have a huge community behind behind that for example if i'm talking about uh postgresql Linux, Kubernetes, Python, they are all technologies that have a mass adoption and which brings a significant level of, of protection, meaning that uh, it will be hard for the license model of those solutions to change. And uh, as, as it is an open standard, you are less, I would say, locked to, to, to those solutions and they will maybe be more reused over the cloud, over the cloud uh, providers. Uh, at least easily uh, to allow you to uh, better, uh, I mean, or to, to less be locked uh, to a specific technology. Then the, the the other point and the other solution, of course, is to go to multi-cloud. I mean, multi-cloud, you will have a high availability. You will uh, take the best of each cloud providers. You will be less lock-in. Uh, for sure, there are uh, multiple advantages of it, but it will also bring a lot of complexity that you have to think of, uh, that you have to put in your balance uh, because you will th need to think about data replication, latency, uh, cost, when, you are, when we are talking about uh, network cost, when you exchange some data, so ingress, egress, it's what uh, also uh, Remy was talking uh, uh, earlier. So everything is not possible with multi-cloud and you have to really think about it. Uh, and when we are talking about multi-cloud, sometimes we are only talking about technology, but you have also to think about competencies, about skills that you have internally. Uh, it, it, will it be easy to find someone that will know all the cloud providers? I would say no, <laughs> this is my answer. Uh, but uh, uh, you have to think about the, the human that you have in your, in your organization to answer that multi-cloud strategy and approach. And all of that, in fact, will build the last solution for me, which is your, I would say, disaster recovery plan, or at least, um, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, anti-vendor looking plan, uh, which is clearly something that should not be built once, uh, and you do, do not have to be forced to build it. It's more, for me, a way of life, uh, a way of uh, dealing with your production, with your day-to-day -day activity, in order to uh, to sum all of those solutions that we have seen to build that uh, disaster rec recovery plan or that anti-locking plan, that strategy to avoid to be uh, to be locked to to a particular technology or to a particular service provider. And so the APIs are one of the services that you can find on uh, on the cloud services. And uh, it, I mean the APIs are the same as uh, an object storage, a database on AWS, Azure, and so on, you might be locked to, to some APIs, but by definition, the APIs is yet, uh, I mean, is a, is a standard. So you can rely on it uh, as it is universally accepted for me. And it's quite expected that an APIs is open like any other standards that we have talked about. Uh, 
uh, the API will also allow you to have that abstraction layer so that whether you are on AWS or on Azure and, or, or on Scaleway, you have that, um, that benefit of not showing to your clients uh, the movement, the migration that you are doing behind it. So for me, API is really a glue between all the services that you will propose and also all the services that will that you will consume uh, it is the the uh, pierre angulaire in french <laughs> i don't have the, the word in english but it's really the way you will map uh, all the uh, services that will be used and all the uh, the application services that you will propose so finally, to conclude on it, uh, I will say that uh, if you have to remember just one thing is always expect the worst and be prepared. Uh, we all know that tomorrow, maybe uh, AWS could be down, uh, Scaleway could be down, OVH could be down. Uh, for so many reasons, you might lose your the access to your accounts. So always be prepared, but be prepared all along your journey uh to uh to set up and to implement your workload on the cloud and not only when you need it it's great, very great. important I don't great know if advice you want to adrian that. thanks do you have your um contact details in the slide so people yep. just okay cool so let's put that up okay fantastic so there's the there's adrian and uh justin's email there but if you want to get in touch with remy you can do so via justin here from uh, scaleway um uh, or Remy, is it just Remy at scaleway.com? Uh, uh, contact Justin and he will uh, forward to me. Fantastic. Okay, great. The Fantastic to hear from you both. Thanks for your time today. Um, that's the end of our first track um, for uh, sessions for this morning. Uh, we'll now have a short break and we'll join you for our next set of talks uh, coming up uh, in about half an hour or so. So enjoy your break and see you back here for more talks on data governance. Cheers.